Uh, and tonight, tonight we're going to continue uh, looking at the uh, Samyutta Nikaya, the Connected Discourses, and we're going to do uh, one more night, probably just one more night, on the section about the skandhas. So we're going to do another sutra, and in fact, tonight we might also do two sutras. So tonight we're going to be doing a sutta called the uh, Gadala Badha Sutta, the leash. And there's actually two two versions of the leash. Um, it's Sutra number 99 and Sutra 100 in the Skandha section. And the leash is part of the, the section of the Skandha section. It's part of the section that's um, the flowers. And we read a sutra from this section last uh, last week. And this is a section where the Buddha is talking about the five aggregates, talking about the skandhas. But these little sutras, the Buddha is using a different metaphor, or technically, I suppose, a simile to describe the aggregates. So the last time it was the simile of transcending attachment to the aggregates and therefore being like a lotus flower that transcends the mud and the water of the pond and blossoms. So that was sort of the metaphor last week. Tonight, we're going to be looking at this different simile of the leash, but it's not exactly, I, I obviously, I want to talk about the whole sutra, but there's one topic that we haven't really looked at, at least not recently. So uh, yeah, let's go ahead and dive in. If you have the big book, the big uh, wisdom publication edition. I'm on page 957. Uh, otherwise, we've got suttacentral.com uh, and all of that. So let's just start with the beginning of this sutra. Um, once again, as usual, we're at Savati or Shravasti. And at Shravasti, the Buddha said this. Bhikkhus. This samsara is without discoverable beginning. A first point is not discerned of beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. Let's clarify some terms and then we'll re read, read the sutra. So right away, we are sort of introduced to the new topic, which is this idea of samsara. So at least as far as like our conversations about the five aggregates goes, we haven't encountered this. So it's why I wanted to focus on this sutra tonight. Uh, both, both of these, both versions of the leash are very interesting. But in case like you don't know, or, you know, maybe you don't know much, Let's have a quick conversation about samsara, because again, it's what the sutra is about. And the Buddha is not going to exactly tell us anything. I mean, he presumes, the sutra presumes you know about samsara or samsara. So I was trying to find out more about this word, this idea and, you know, I was reading through all the suttas, all the early Buddhist literature. And then the word or the idea of samsara, it does seem to have uh, an existence outside of Buddhism, by which I mean in the kind of the Vedic tradition, the Vedas and the Upanishads. But as you may or may not know, when it comes to the Upanishads, these kind of, you know, kind of. Indian philosophical literature, the Upanishads, a lot of the Upanishads are actually in dialogue with Buddhism. So the Upanishads aren't exactly these ancient, ancient texts in that way. I mean, some of the contents of them is ancient, but a lot of it is much more contemporaneous with the Buddha. And even still, the idea of samsara as it is, or not actually the idea, 
the term samsara, it only appears every now and then in the Vedas and the Upanishads, apparently. And it's used in a kind of similar way as it's used in the Buddhist tradition. So let me tell you what that is. So in my looking at this, the Buddhist use of the word samsara, well, actually, let's quickly do the etymology of this word really quickly. So the root of this word, samsara, the root of it, is, so the prefix is S-A-M, sam, and then it's, the root of it is, is this root shur. So there's this word samsara, which is related to samsara, and shur, S, but it's a sh with an R, so shur. It basically is a root word that means to go. And then sam shi is to basically seemingly to kind of go along with. Because sam is like together with. So a sam shi, sam shi is to kind of go together with. And the word ultimately means or is used to mean wandering or roaming. That's basically what the what the literal word means to wander or to roam. And in particular, to kind of roam around. Like that's the kind of the meaning of it, to roam around. But but this is what I want to tell you though about it in terms of like, you know, just something to think about tonight. The way that the Buddha uses the word samsara it seems not so much as a like a super technical term or like a, a really metaphysical idea. I know, and we're going to talk about reincarnation tonight, and it, there is a sense in which it has to do with kind of birth, death, and rebirth. But I was thinking about it like before class tonight, and I was thinking, you know, I think it's a it's kind of similar to this. It, it, actually, it's similar to this in many ways. You know, in English, we have this phrase or this word, this idea, the grind. And there's a way in which, like, you know, back to the grind. There's a way in which we kind of probably, you know, if, if provided that you're familiar with that term, we know what the grind is. But what is the grind? Like, is it just like a job? Mm, it has a lot to do with a job, but the grind is like life, right? It's like bills and it's like just the grind. It seems to me that the Buddha is using samsara the way we use that idea of the grind. It's sort of more poetic than metaphysical in that way. And so tonight, I want us to kind of have that in the back of our mind, that the roaming, the wandering, it's kind of like the grind in that way, where it is referring to something very real, something experienced by all of us in a way, but it's a little more like, you know it when you know it, or you know it when you feel it in that way. So like, let's just keep that in mind. So that's a basic idea of samsara, that it's this roaming or wandering around, but it kind of is an Im implies something about the nature of life, like the grind. Let's just keep, well, let's keep reading the sutra and then we'll kind of get more into the nitty gritty of all of this. No, actually, there's one more thing that we need to talk about before we can do that. So in the opening here, this is very significant, by the way. The Buddha, this is what the Buddha says. He says, this samsara is without discoverable beginning. A first point cannot be known or cannot be discerned or the first, a first point is not discerned, 
of beings roaming and wandering on hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. So the thing that I want to mention before we go further is this interesting idea that samsara has no starting point. It has no discernible beginning. Now, I'm not going to say too much about this because there's an entire section. It's uh, section 15 of the Samyutta Nikaya. And these are a group of suttas that are the connected discourses on being without a discoverable beginning. It's a bunch of sutras about the idea of samsara, in particular, samsara not having a beginning. I think next week we might jump into that section. So I'm not going to say too much about this weird idea of samsara not having a beginning, because that's like a whole conversation by itself. So that'll probably be the connective tissue leading us to next week. We'll still probably have to talk about it a little bit tonight but just let it be known there'll be a more in-depth conversation next week suffice it, suffice it to say for now that this idea of reincarnation the birth death rebirth cycle the roaming the wandering samsara let's just say it has no beginning the buddha is telling us has no beginning no starting point the roaming and wandering of beings being hindered, and actually the idea is actually being covered. The word is nivarana, being covered by ignorance and being shackled by craving, being bound, uh, fettered. Uh, the word is bandha, bound in that way. So there comes a time, bhikkhus, when the great oceans dry up and evaporate and no longer exist. But still, I say, there's no making an end of suffering for those beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. There comes a time, bhikkhus, when Mount Sumeru, the king of mountains, burns up, perishes, and no longer exists. But still, I say, there's no making an end of suffering for those beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. There comes a time, bhikkhus, when the great earth burns up and perishes and no longer exists. But still I say, there's no making an end of suffering for those beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. All right. And then, we're, then we'll get to the leash. But really quickly, in case you don't know, the Buddha is describing or he, he is talking about a kind of generally accepted Indian cosmological view. And this is a generally accepted cosmological view that Buddhism sort of adopts. And what it is, is that basically for the Buddhists and Indian, like Indian philosophy and cosmology, the world, like the universe, the solar system, it goes through a process of creation, sustaining, destruction, and nothingness, only to then return and be created again, <laughs> to sus be sustained again, only to be destroyed again, only to be created again. In other words, in Indian thinking, the whole universe goes through a process of reincarnation, not just every being in that world universe. So the Buddha is actually talking about the end of a world, a end of a world system in which basically things start burning up. They start, uh, begins with this kind of uh, evaporating of the oceans and then after the oceans, all the land masses and the mountains, and then after the land masses and the mountains, the earth, but they mean like the, the firmament, the foundation upon which the mountains sit. And then there's nothingness, but then it all starts over again. And 
we could certainly identify the cyclical nature of this as therefore having no beginning in that way. That's not exactly why I think, uh, and this is from reading that other section that we're going to get to next week. That's not exactly why samsara is beginningless. It's not just because of the cyclical nature of it, but it's sort of one thing to think about in that way, that the the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth just keeps going on and on and on. It has been going on and on and on forever in that sense. So, okay, before we get to the leash, any questions so far? Basic stuff. Cool. All right, so now we get to the actual simile. The Buddha says, suppose bhikkhus, a dog tied up on a leash was bound to a strong post or pillar. It would just keep on running and revolving around that same post or pillar. So too, the uninstructed worldling regards form as self or self as in form. And by the way, you'll notice that that part of the sutra is abbreviated. You can jump over to page 855. That's the first sutta in this collection where it'll, it lays out the entire formula. So if you want, you can go back to 855. But I do want to talk about that really quickly. But again, it's just like a dog tied to a leash, bound to a strong pillar. It would just keep running and revolving around that same poster pillar. So too, the uninstructed worldling regards form as self or sensations as self or perception as self, conditioning, volitional formations as self or consciousness as self. And he just keeps running and revolving around form, just running and revolving around sensations, just running around perception just running around volitional formations and just running around consciousness. And he keeps on running around and around and he keeps on running and revolving around them. And he's not freed from form. He's not freed from sensations, not freed from perception, not freed from conditioning, not freed from consciousness. He's not freed from birth not freed from aging, not free from death, not freed from sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair, not freed from suffering, I say. So before we get to the instructed noble disciple, let's talk a little bit about what it means to be like this dog on this leash. So, the first thing, just a, a real quick uh, language thing. So uh, the title of this sutra is Gaddala, G-A-D-D-U-L-A, Gaddala Badha. Gaddala is a leather strap. So it's specifically something made of leather and it's a strap, but that could be used for, you know, other things. A baddaha is this leash, the idea of being like bound by something. So the gaddala baddha is this leather strap, leather leash. And that the, the, the fact that it's made of leather is what points to it being a dog's leash because it's very difficult for dogs to chew through in that way. So... The root of that second word, baddaha, that, well, the root of that word, baddaha, you know, is da, da, dar, to have or to hold, like in Dharma and those other words we've talked about. But this is baddaha, which is kind of related to another word that we talk about, bandaha. And bandaha is where we get the English word bondage from or bound. That's all the words come from Sanskrit or those type of words. So it's this being bound by this leather leash in that way, right? And then just moving in circles. That's the simile. 
But the Buddha says, yeah, an uninstructed worldling who regards form as self, sensations, perception, conditioning, or consciousness, they're just like that dog bound to the post of form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. So because I haven't done it for a moment, I wanted to take a, a second and kind of remind us and like reiterate that idea of the five skandhas, but particularly this idea of regarding form as self or self as in form or form having self or self having form. I want to talk a little bit more about what they're getting at. Like, so this is like the, the, the Dharma talk proper portion of the evening in that way. So I was thinking about it. And what I really wanted to talk about particularly was I really wanted to talk about the fourth aggregate, the fourth uh, skandha. So, you know, samskara. Samskara, translated as volitional formations, I uh, translated as conditioning or habits or habit energy, a variety of ways. But I wanted to actually talk more specifically about how, how could it be or what does it mean to regard conditioning as self? My point is, is that like when the Buddha talks about regarding form as self, that I get clearly because it's about regarding the body of physical form as me. And there could be kind of nothing more normal than regarding the physical body of form as self. Now, of course, what we are always talking about in Dharma doors is the problem. And I don't mean the suffering problem with regarding the physical body as self. I mean the problem of which body of form then? <laughs> the childhood body of form when you were only this big? The adolescent body of form? Like which, oh, I know you mean this body of form. Like this one right now? Well, what happens when I oh, lost a hair? Oh, look, it's a new body of form. So is there ever a static body of form to be identified with? That's the problem with that idea of identifying as the body of form, but the form is always changing. So that's to regard the body of form. But I wanted to, again, I wanted to focus on what would it mean to identify with or to identify as conditioning? And this was also, I wanted to do this to, you know, give us a much clearer understanding about the fourth aggregate as well. So the analogy that I want to use, or the example, I guess, that I want to use, I thought of this one, I think it was at the, even at the end of last week's Dharma Doors. Let's take someone who, as a child, adolescent, what have you, Let's say that that person, and it could be you, but, you know, as a child, that that person doesn't know how to play the piano. They would like to play the piano, but they don't know how to play the piano. They've never played it. They've never been taught it. So it's just an idea that one could do that, but I, I don't know how to play the piano. So what that means is, so let's say you sit me down right now in front of the piano. What that means is, is that I am the present body of form. So that would be my younger adolescent body. Sensations, of course, would be the sensations that I'm having. Like if I'm playing ding, 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 the piano, I would be hearing the sound of the piano and I might find the sound of the piano pleasing. So that would be a positive vidana, a positive sensory reaction to the sound of the piano. And so I would be that physical form body having those sensations 
of hearing the piano and I would be in a position to perceive that it is a piano. So there's form, sensation, perception. And now as an adolescent, my current state of conditioning is such that I cannot play the piano. And then of course, there's the present state of consciousness, which is me sitting in front of this piano thinking, I'd like to be able to play the piano. I sure like what the sound of the piano is like. I perceive that there is a piano here, but I don't know how to play it. So in other words, at that state as an adolescent, I am identifying with that physical body, with the sensations I'm perceiving, and I'm also identifying as someone who doesn't know how to play the piano. Let the conditioning begin, <laughs> by which I mean the piano lessons. So I get a teacher and they begin conditioning me in how to play the piano. And I go to lesson after lesson after lesson until I become conditioned in playing the piano. Fast forward five years. New body of physical form because I've gone through puberty now and I am now a, a larger body. So I am not that old body of form. Because I've been playing the piano now for a while, my sensations regarding the piano are is much more refined. I know like, you know, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Like I know the musical chart. And so my reaction to sensations is different because I've had so much exposure to the piano. In fact, my perception of the piano is no longer just like, ooh, I like that. That sounds nice. Now my perception could be, ooh, that's Bach. Oh, Beethoven. So in other words, my perception is different because I've been studying the piano. So I know more. And so when I hear music, I now can hear, oh, that's Bach, that's Beethoven. Five years ago, it was just music that I liked. So my perception of the sensations was different. And now, five years later, I can play the piano. That's identifying with or as conditioning. That I'm someone who can play the piano. And then, of course, there's a state of consciousness that is arising. And now, let, let me actually, let me give you a much, a, a, a kind of, I want to drive this to a certain place. Five years after studying the piano, I am now a, um, not like a concert pianist, but I perform, let's say. And it's my big, um, what do they call that uh, when you... Uh, Forget, but there's there's a name for when you uh, recital, right? It's my my big night of my piano recital. So I'm on stage, and there I am playing the piano. And then when I'm done, I get this the, the big standing ovation. I am now on stage with the conscious experience of being the person who just played the piano because that's my that's who I am the piano player and so i'm having this conscious experience of you know the praise of the audience but what we want to notice is is that that state of consciousness of being the one who performed the piano recital that state of consciousness could not have existed 5 years prior what we're talking about, what we have been talking about now for weeks and weeks and weeks is that mind can and does identify with the physical body, identifies as the physical body. Mind clings and identifies with and as 
sensations, perception, skills, habits, conditioning, and of course, right now, I think I'm thinking this. Not thoughts are happening. I'm thinking. I'm conscious. So what I'm, well, I don't need to remind you. The, the point is, is that the uninstructed worldling is somebody who regards form as self or sensations or perception or conditioning or consciousness. And to do that as an uninstructed worldling, to regard form as self or self as in form and so on, that is to be like a dog bound by a leash to a pole and just being stuck and revolving in that way. And that, <clears throat> and that uninstructed worldling is not freed, not freed from the aggregates, not freed from birth, aging, and death, not freed from sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair, not freed from suffering. But the instructed noble disciple who does not regard form as self or self as possessing form, nor sensations as self, nor perception as self, nor volition as self, nor consciousness as in self. That person, those people, they no longer keep running and revolving around form, running and revolving around sensation, around perception, around conditioning, and around consciousness. They no longer keep running and revolving around them. They're freed from form. They're freed from sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. They're freed from birth, freed from aging and death, freed from sorrow, lamentation, pain, despair, displeasure, freed from suffering, I say. Okay, so that's the end of the first version of this sutta, the leash. Questions, comments, ideas before we kind of discuss? Anybody, anything pop up? Be straightforward. Yeah, Noe. <laughs> there we go. Hi, Michael. Hi, Noe. Yes, it just popped out of my head, if I may. Please. So who are those who are those people freed from all of this? You know, it's funny. It's funny you should say that, Noe, because this is exactly what came up last week. It comes up every week. Let me reiterate your question again really quickly, Noe, if I may. The question, of course, is what doesn't regard form as self? What doesn't regard sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness as self? Is that, that correct, Noe? Yeah. So the answer I gave last week is the same answer I'm going to give this week. Here's the point. The point. The Buddha is talking about this tendency of clinging to form or sensations or perception or condition or consciousness. It's this habit or this tendency of clinging. The mind that wants to know what doesn't regard form as self is looking for another thing to cling to. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, great. <laughs> Just point the way to myself. And that's exactly what we are talking about not doing. <laughs> it's very subtle. And I'm very glad you asked the question, Noe because we want to notice the mind's tendency to do that, to want to grab on to then, well, what then, what, what is it then that doesn't regard form as self? Stop doing that. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Cool. 
All right. Um, one last point that I'd like to make before we get to the second version of this, which has a, a bunch of more ideas that are really fun to discuss. I want to mention one, like, yeah, just an idea. So it's kind of related to this idea of samsara not having a discernible beginning, but it's not exactly about that. So I, I know that for many, like, call uh, call them Westerners, right? People of like Western traditions, because we might not really be used to thinking in terms of reincarnation, because we just don't think that way about like, I guess, cosmology, that that's the way it's going. The thing that I want to say is, is that the way that the Buddha talks about samsara as this kind of roaming or wandering, what he's, what he's talking about, as far as I'm concerned, is, you know, for me, it's something I can, I feel like I experience, you know, daily, but my point is, is that it's something that I feel like the, the grind, as I was saying, or like the rut or just the, the roaming, it could be just years of our life stuck in a rut and this kind of roaming and it doesn't have anything to do with death and rebirth and reincarnation it's just about patterns cycles ruts and that idea so i think that i i wanted to encourage everybody to not necessarily read this as being about reincarnation so much as being about being in a cyclical rut in that way so i mean it can obviously is about reincarnation but you know, we don't have to get, we don't have to go that far, I suppose is what I'm saying. So, all right, let's number two. And Noe, I assume you don't still have a question. So okay. delete that. All right. So here's the leash number two. Uh, so this is Sutta number 100 in section 22, page 958. It starts the same, bhikkhus, this samsara is without discoverable beginning, a first point is not discerned of beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. Suppose bhikkhus, a dog tied up on a leash, was bound to a strong post or pillar. If it walks, it walks close to that post or that pillar. If it stands, it stands close to that post or that pillar. If it sits down, it sits down close to that post or pillar. And if it lies down, it lies down close to that post or pillar. So too, bhikkhus, the uninstructed worldling regards form thus. This is mine. This I am. This is myself. He regards sensations. This is mine. This is me. This is myself. Perception, conditioning, and consciousness, also thinking, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. If he walks, he walks close to those five aggregates subject to clinging. If he stands, he stands close to those five aggregates subject to clinging. If he sits down, he sits down close to those five aggregates subject to clinging. If he lies down, he lies down close to those five aggregates subject to clinging. Therefore, bhikkhus, one should often reflect upon one's own mind thus. For a long time, this mind has been defiled by raga, dvesha, and moha, which can be translated as lust, hatred, and delusion, or just attraction, aversion, and confusion. So for a long time, this mind has been defiled by attraction, aversion, and confusion. Through the defilements of the mind, beings are defiled. With the cleansing of the mind, beings are purified. Bhikkhus, have you seen the picture called faring on? 
Yes, venerable sir, the bhikkhus replied. Even that picture called Faring On has been designed in its diversity by the mind. Yet the mind is even more diverse than that picture called Faring On. Therefore, bhikkhus, one should often reflect upon one's own mind thus. For a long time, this mind has been defiled by attraction, aversion, and confusion. Through the, de through the defilements of the mind, beings are defiled. With the cleansing of the mind, beings are purified. All right, let's talk about that for a little bit. So the beginning of the sutra is basically the same. Rather than using the language of regarding form as self or self as form, it uses the other kind of formula, which is that the uninstructed worldling regarding form says, this I am, right? Or this is mine, right? This is my hand, right? Or this I am, or this is myself. <laughs> so that's the uninstructed worldling who again is regarding the aggregates as self in that way. And then the Buddha kind of changes the, the simile a little bit. It's like the dog attached to the leash. If it walks, stands, sits, or lies down, it walks, stands, sits, or lies down right next to that pole or that post. Now, what we want to pick up on, if you didn't pick up on it already, is that sitting, standing, walking, and reclining are the four postures, the four meditative postures. And so it's kind of interesting that the Buddha is saying that when the uninstructed world link sits, stands, walks, or reclines, they sit, stand, walk, and recline right next to the aggregates, right? So interesting thing to think about the next time you sit down to meditate, right? Are you sitting down right next to the aggregates in that way? So there's that. Um, and then we are introduced to, to this new prompt. Therefore, bhikkhus, one should often reflect upon one's own mind thus. For a long time, this mind has been defiled by the three poisons, by the three kleshas, right? Through the defilements of the mind, beings are defiled. With the cleansing of the mind, beings are purified. That's the Dharma. That's Buddhism. That's the teaching. Always has been. That it is these three afflictions, these three poisons, Raga, Devesha, and Moha, translated a variety of ways, of course, right? But the basic idea of Raga is that it's about attraction. Traditionally, it's kind of about sexual attraction. That's why it gets translated as lust often. But we really, as good Buddhists, we want to be thinking about it doesn't matter. It could be sex, drugs, rock and roll, whatever it is on the other end. The idea that, yeah, that's going to do it. That's going to make me happy. That's the attraction. That's the very idea the Buddha is talking about. That's what has defiled the mind for a very long time, is the attraction. I want to remind everybody, too, that, you know, in Buddhist cosmology, which is different than traditional Indian cosmology in this regard, in traditional Indian cosmology, reincarnation Reincarnation happens because you have built up all of this past karma. This is the traditional Indian cosmology. You've done all of this stuff. You've, you've performed all of this past karma that needs to play out. And so you, through all of your past actions, have created the conditions or the circumstances to be reborn. According to the Buddhist tradition, it's not your past actions that cause your rebirth in this world. It's actually the fact that you love it. Now, 
and you want to come back as soon as possible. So it's not past karma that keeps us coming back. In the Buddhist tradition, it's our own wanting and our own desiring right now that keeps us plunging back in for more. So that's an important kind of point to note about Buddhism and reincarnation, that it's not past karma, it's actually present karma. So there's the attraction that's defiling the mind, and then there's the aversion. Get that away from me. And then, of course, that aversion can turn into bitterness, anger, resentment, hostility, violence, all kinds of stuff can arise from aversion. But that's the idea, is that we spend our lives chasing the attraction and avoiding the aversion. And then there's that third poison or that third klesha, which is the confusion, the moha. I teach, my general way of teaching moha is that ultimately the third poison, the confusion, it's all a kind of confusion about the nature of the self. It is about thinking or part of the confusion is thinking this is yourself, identifying with this physical body as self. And that, as we've, all the sutras that we've studied up to this point, the last many weeks, the, the sutras we studied before this were pointing to why attachment to the aggregates causes suffering. It's because we're attached to them the way they are. And then they change. And we're like, what's with this new feeling? What's with this new sensation? And it bothers us because we don't like change ultimately. But the problem is impermanence. It's always changing all the time. So if change bothers you, I've got bad news. <laughs> I got really bad news for you. Probably you should get with it then. <laughs> that way it's like, it's going to be changing all the time. The aggregates are going to be changing all the time teeth are going to start falling out eventually. And if we are really attached to the old body of form, it's going to freak us out when the teeth start falling out in that way. So this attraction and aversion, what we want to notice is the, ooh, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And the aversion, get that away from me. Get that away from me. I want you to notice that both of those poisons, both of those afflictions in terms of, ooh, give me or get that away from me, they're both predicated on the idea of the self that would, that would gain benefit from getting that, that would gain benefit from avoiding that. So I'm kind of pointing at how the three poisons sort of support each other in a way like the more we want it's going to keep creating that delusion of a self that's somehow in the aggregates and then the more we are averse the same thing's going to happen so they keep reinforcing themselves in that way that's what the buddha is talking about regarding the mind has been defiled for a very long time about this the mind has been defiled with the thought of self for a very long time. And the idea here is, by the way, and this is a particularly early Buddhist point of view. The early Buddhist point of view is that we have been stuck in the delusion of self for a long time. And therefore, it's a very deeply ingrained habit. And what that means is, is that it's not just going to be one Dharma talk and, and you're going to be like, oh, that's what's going on. Thanks. Liberation. <laughs> it's not, that's not it. You could hear this repeatedly. It's not going to amount to much when you've been hearing about the self and been thinking in terms of self for kulpas and kulpas and eons and eons. So my point is, is that this is, at least in the early Buddhist way of thinking, this is a long process of 
not identifying with the aggregates because again it's been going on for a very long time in that sense so all right so before we get to the really interesting part about this uh uh picture faring on any questions about samsara aggregate stuff yeah maria Um, it, <clears throat> it's more of a comment. It seems so tricky that the aversion to, it's so hard to not be aversive to suffering, but the aversion to suffering only leads to more suffering. Like at some point we have to get to the point where we see the suffering as the way through um i guess so just wanted to let's i want to i want to clarify a few a few things so aversion to suffering i want to be careful about that one because it it actually in a certain in a certain way it is an aversion to suffering that propels us to move away from it that it would propel us to practice to do anything so let's do something interesting real quick. I've been wanting to actually do this for a while. Why not do it now? I want to quickly, uh, this is a very classic Buddhist Dharma talk thing to mention, by the way, but I haven't mentioned it for a while. I want to really distinguish pain from suffering. And by pain, I mean like physical pain in that way. Yes, we want to avoid and having an aversion to physical pain is uh, necessary in a certain way. So well, I want to be clear about this, but let me give you a subtle thing to think about regarding all of this. And maybe this will help us kind of recalibrate what we or how we think about aversion. So a great, a lesson that I've, I learned fairly, not recently, but, you know, within the past probably 10 years or so, and it, it, this is a lesson that kind of, it blew me away and, and it, it's just, you know, really stayed with me. And it was an incredible rethinking of pain. And what it is, is if looked at the right way, physical pain is the great teacher. Hold on. The point is, is, and, and I, so I heard somebody say, I heard somebody say this and I, it made me laugh. So I, I want to repeat it because I think it's funny, but it's really, I think to the point. And what it is, is I heard this person say, human beings are so stupid that if we didn't have pain, we would rip out our intestines and swing them around like decorations. And so it's the fact that it hurts that we don't do that. It's the fact that when I put my hand on the stove and it hurts, it's a lesson to not do that again. And there's a way that you can be grateful for that, those lessons in that way. What I'm getting at is, is that there's a mental anguish. This is what they sometimes call the second arrow in Buddhism, where there's there's getting struck by the first arrow, which is the pain. Then there's the extra layer of suffering that we add on top of it, which is this very personal, like, why is this happening to me? And why does this always have to happen to me? And da, 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 like all of this kind of mental anguish, which is different than the initial arrow in that sense. So I'm saying all this, Maria, just to get us to look more carefully at aversion because we are actually, I mean, I know that I am averse to physical pain, but I'm averse to it maybe for the wrong reasons in that way. So just complicating your comment more than, you know, but, all right, cool. So yeah, let's talk about, so this, the end of this sutra, uh, for me, the end of this sutra gets really interesting and it begins with this, uh, 
with the Buddha saying, hey guys, have you seen the picture called Faring On? So when I first read this, whenever I read, read this recently, I was really struck by how modern that sounds. Like, it's basically like, like, hey, did you see the latest movie? Hey, have you guys, hey guys, have you seen that picture faring on? So first of all, I just found it very interesting that. But what is this picture that the Buddha is talking about? We're not exactly sure if you read if you read Bhikkhu Bodhi's footnote, uh, it's footnote 207. He has a really interesting footnote about what this might be. Uh, there's like a clue in the title. But from Bhikkhu Bodhi's uh, footnote, it does sound like the Buddha is describing something that looks or something that would look a little bit like this classic, uh, the Bhava Chakra Mandala. So this is uh, Mara. And this is the, what's called the wheel of life, right? The Bhava Chakra. And this describes the reincarnation process, the six paths of rebirth, the 12 link chain of dependent origination. The Buddha might be referring to this or maybe like a very early version of this or something like this. We're not exactly sure, but he seems to be referring to some sort of painting and again if you read bhikkhu bodhi's footnote it seems like he's referring to a painting that was used to describe reincarnation and ultimately a kind of a painting that would encourage you to be moral and virtuous so you go to heaven and to avoid being bad and going to hell so it was like a morality painting which by the way that is that i just showed you is a similar kind of a thing. So the Buddha says, have you seen that picture called Faring On? And they all say, yeah, we've seen it. And the Buddha says, even that picture called Faring On has been designed in its diversity by the mind. Yet the mind is even more diverse than that picture called Faring On. Therefore, bhikkhus, one should reflect upon one's own mind thus. For a long time, the mind has been defiled by three poisons. And then through defilements, the, the, the minds are through defilements, the mind of beings are defiled. With the cleansing of the mind, the eradication of the three poisons, the mind of beings is purified. Bhikkhus. I do not see any other order of living beings so diversified as those in the animal realm. Even those beings in the animal realm have been diversified by the mind, yet the mind is even more diverse than those beings in the animal realm. Therefore, bhikkhus, one should often reflect upon one's own mind thus, for a long time the mind has been defiled by the three poisons, through the defilements, the mind is defiled. With the cleansing of the mind, beings are purified. Yeah, and I'll read this last one, then let's have a big talk about all of this. Suppose, bhikkhus, an artist or a painter using dye or lac or turmeric or indigo or crimson would create the figure of a man or a woman complete in all its features on a well-polished plank or wall or canvas. So too, when the uninstructed worldling produces anything, it is only form that they produce, only sensations they produce, only perception they produce, only conditioning they produce, only consciousness that they produce. And then there's the last paragraph, which I'm gonna wait on. So let's go back to, hold on, we'll get there. But let's go back to this painting that is made by the mind, but the mind is more diverse than the painting. And then this idea of the animal realm with its diversity. So personally, I don't entirely know what to make of this section. Um, 
I have thoughts, I have ideas. I mentioned last week, or maybe it was two weeks ago. Actually, I feel like it's come up a few times, but a number of these uh, suttas on the aggregates, a number of these have had hints of what could be called like early yogacara, like early mind-only Buddhism. So if you're familiar with this Mahayana tradition called yogacara or vinyapti matra, the mind-only or consciousness-only school, there's traces of this idea, this teaching of everything being mind-only. There's traces of it in the early Buddhist canon. And this last these last few paragraphs sound very mind only to me in that way. By talking about the complexities of this painting or even the complexities and diversity of the natural world of animals, and then saying in particular this line, even those beings in the animal realm have been diversified by the mind. Yet the mind is even more diverse than those beings in the animal realm. Now, Bhikkhu Bodhi, who is, of course, a very classic Theravada early Buddhist, he, if you read his footnote, he interprets that as referring to the diversity of rebirth possibilities. Meaning, you know, there's just so many possibilities for each of us to be reborn, whether as a dog or a cat or as a giraffe or as a this or a that. So Bhikkhu Bodhi definitely isn't moving in the mind only Yogacara direction. He's keeping, you know, squarely within early kind of Buddhism. But I don't know if I'd read it that way. This idea of the diversity of that painting, the diversity of the animal realm and the mind being more diverse than all of those the thought that comes to my mind being somebody who's like kind of steeped in yogacara buddhism of course but the idea that comes to my mind is thinking about how every night we create worlds worlds not just creatures not just other people entire cities, entire worlds in our dreams, meaning our dreams, our mind of the dream is able to create entire worlds. And I don't know how, you know, if you've really thought about this, like the degree to which we fabricate these worlds every night. And for the most part, they're indistinguishable from this world. That's why we're usually tricked by them into thinking that it's just another day in our life because they are so like this in that way. Now, when I first started studying mind-only Yogacara Buddhism, the Yogacara tradition refers to the dream state all the time in pointing at how the mind has the total ability to create an entire world populated with beings. So the Yogacara tradition doesn't take it lightly that the mind can do that. And then the only thing that happens in the Yogacara tradition is they ultimately say, yeah, and you're doing it right now. <laughs> you're fabricating a world right now in that way. So I read those last few sections there I read it that way, but of course, I want you to know that the traditional Theravada way is just talking about the variety of species speaks to the varieties of karmic behavior. I think that's the way that Bhikkhu Bodhi would sort of interpret that. So, but then the last paragraph I read is straight out of a Yogacara uh, text. In fact, there are Yogacara sutras in which the Buddha literally says the mind is a painter that paints with dharmas that paints with ideas 
it's one of my favorite lines from a sutra that the mind is a painter that paints with ideas. So profound. Well, the Buddha basically said here, suppose an artist or a painter using dye or indigo or turmeric creates the figure of a woman or a man complete in all its features. So too, the uninstructed worldling, when the uninstructed worldling produces anything, it's only form that they produce, only sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness that they produce. So that's kind of very similar to that. Now, this is still, of course, an early Buddhist sutta. So when the Buddha is talking about when the uninstructed worldling produces anything, they're just producing form, sensation, perception, conditioning, or consciousness. I would now want to go back to my original analogy earlier this morning, or this morning, earlier this evening, about the piano player. And it's the idea that the uninstructed worldling thinks they played the piano. Thinks that they did it. That's what the Buddha, or how I understand what the Buddha is saying at the end, is that idea of that in actuality, the only thing that has been produced is form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. So that the only thing that has been produced is a state of consciousness that thinks it played the piano. <laughs> but the me playing the piano, that never happened because the me has always been a kind of confusion to begin with in that way. By the way, I do want to take this moment before we read that important last paragraph. I do want to take this moment to like remind everybody that when I, me personally, when I'm thinking about this stuff and thinking about this idea of the playing the piano and then this kind of delusion or confusion, which is this idea that I played the piano. And then the Buddha is talking about, no, the only thing that was produced was form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. For me, the way that I understand that is, you, as you know, because if you've been coming to Dharma Doors, you've heard this from me a lot. For me, an enlightened state of being is a lot like a flow state. I've used this example in the past. And so I want to kind of, I want you to think about, I, you know, I hope that you've had a moment of that kind of more ecstatic flow state in doing whatever it is that you like to do in that sense. Maybe it's playing music, maybe it's art, whatever. But that experience we can have of losing ourselves in an activity. In particular, I think often of playing musical instruments because that's a state in which it happens to me. But it's that state in which you're playing, you know, you're playing the ukulele. And all of a sudden, there's this feeling that it's just happening. And I'm not playing it. I'm kind of witnessing the playing but I'm in this kind of flow state where it's just kind of happening and it's beautiful. It's amazing. That's what I feel like the Buddha is talking about in terms of the difference between a kind of deluded claiming of ownership of activity versus a more not clinging ownership, but just a kind of blissful experience of it happening in that sense. And the Buddha is talking about the mental anguish that comes from the clinging to it as I'm playing the piano, right? And then, of course, we can really start to analyze this, which is that think about me playing the piano and I'm playing the piano in a very clingy me way. Like I'm... I'm so good at playing the piano. Everybody's listening to me play the piano. I'm, you know, I'm the star of the show, right? And then all of a sudden, bang, you, you hit that bad note. 
all of a sudden, the piano player who it was them playing the piano, they now can start having feelings of inadequacy, shame, and like, oh, I totally screwed up. Oh my God, I'm a terrible piano player. Notice how the mental anguish can arise when there's that clinging of me playing the piano, because that's the thing about it. It cuts both ways. Meaning when everybody's applauding and you're like, yeah, that was me playing the piano. We like that version. We like the version where people like us, but we, we kind of wish we could only have that version and not the other version where the people don't like us. And then we're like shameful and full of whatever. So notice that it's a package deal. It's both. And that's called dukkha. That's called suffering. Wanting the praise and being averse to the blame. That's the attraction aversion game. And so I want you to notice or think about that blissful state of just playing. And who cares? Like a bad note. The show goes on, right? And there's just this sense of there's what happened, but it wasn't my fault. It's just something that happened. How could something happening be a fault? Well, it could be of considered a fault if there's that clinging to me as the one doing it in that way. So, all right, questions, com comments, answers, ideas before the big last paragraph. Yeah, no. What's, what's that mean, Maria? Hmm. Yeah, I was curious about that too. It means I threw a comment in the chat. Oh, which I'm not the best at looking. Um, the flow state. Well, my, oh, my I was just saying, like, ah. it's interesting how in the flow state, it's a little like an out of body experience when yep. you're not the self for a moment. Yeah, um, and this, and Maria, and that kind of goes to Noe's question from a while ago of like the, what is it that doesn't cling? And I want us to notice that there is a, an intellectual way to ask that question that kind of wants to know what is it that doesn't cling to form sensation? You know, what is it that doesn't cling to the aggregates? And that's like a very, again, a very rational, logical, clingy way of wondering. But notice this, rather than asking the question, what is it that doesn't cling to the aggregates? How about this one? What's it like to not cling to the aggregates? Well, it's not suffering. That's the whole Dharma. That's the point. <laughs> so we don't need to know what it is. It's better to know what it's like in that sense. So, all right. So this last paragraph, you'll notice that there's a lots of ellipses. And that's because, again, it's referring to, and I couldn't find the full treatment of this, but the very end of this sutra, the Buddha asks, what do you think, bhikkhus? Is form permanent or impermanent? And everybody says, impermanent, venerable sir. And then the Buddha asks in the longer version, and is what is impermanent suitable to be considered self? And the bhikkhus all go, no. And then the Buddha says, uh, therefore, seeing thus, one understands self is not form, sensation, perception, conditioning, or consciousness. So the last part of this, it's about a contemplation regarding the ever-changing, ever-flowing nature of the aggregates, and that they are ultimately impermanent. All five of them are impermanent. And so the Buddha asks the, the bhikkhus, asks the, the practitioners, and is what is impermanent, is that suitable to be called self? No. So that's that idea that I was mentioning kind of also at the beginning of the evening, which is that you, you can 
identify with the body as self, but that gets tricky because it's impermanent in that it's always changing. So what's the you part of it? And that, of course, is the big question that we've kind of been dancing around all night, is that idea of the you part of it. And that's where we get to the Buddhist realization of, oh, there just isn't that me. It's a confusion. <laughs> it's a stain on the mind to think in terms of self in that way. So, so that's kind of the conclusion of that sutra. That's confusion of both those sutras. Any uh, thoughts, questions, or comments? Yeah, Noe. Great stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the comments too of there are those those states that have happened to me while I performed in my and and. Never admit your mistakes <laughs> was an interesting comment that I have heard. Never admit to your mistakes <laughs> in, in a performance idea because my performance was silent. There was just what was happening and it was quite successful. Even though I had the critic, I knew what the mistake was. I didn't have to tell anyone. Mm -hmm. For them, it was their experience. I left it as their experience. Um, so when somebody says, when I pick up a picture frame, there's no picture, there's no frame, and I look at it, and 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 they say, oh, I see my father there, I see my mother there, I see my sister, I see my lover there, and I'm, and my answer is always yes. It doesn't matter what I see; hmm. it's what I'm creating for them to see, or the emo, the, the sensation, <laughs> the aggregates that I'm creating <laughs> for them. To see so that they can identify with the story, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it's that idea of letting go of the critique. There, there's no mistakes. There's never a mistake. Uh, um, hmm. No, my friend, if I may, my friend said, I really, I really messed up that performance. And I said, no, you didn't. You didn't mess anything up. It was perfect the sound engineer who forgot to turn on the music because he was high on acid, he messed up your <laughs> performance. You didn't mess up your performance. So it is this place. Yes. Thank mm. you for listening. Yeah. Yeah. I would actually go maybe take that a step further and rather than not, not being about there being no critique so much as no critic. Not in, just bringing it back to what kind of the topic tonight of that, idea of self that's sort of judging <laughs> yeah. yeah no i just really like the the dog and the leash analogy it just it really i i mean without repeating it because you already <laughs> described it it just it did something it it was palpable and and really useful in thinking about the skandhas and the self. So thank you for that. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely why I wanted to do the sutta because of that powerful metaphor. It's so kind of visual, kind of sad in a way, the way the Buddha describes this just turning and turning, right? Just so like, it does make you want to get off the wheel or, yeah. you know, get off the merry-go-round in that way. And I think it'll be interesting to contemplate, you know, when I sit, just that idea of, am I sitting close? <laughs> yeah. And again, I'm so, happy that Noe, sitting close to I'm so happy that Noe asked that provocative question about, you know, that everybody is wondering, what is it that doesn't cling? And I'm glad that we could address not doing that, not trying to think about it that way and noticing that that's that mind trying to do what it wants to do and then versus this oh and i would re re really like everybody to feel the um to feel the freedom in that like freedom from the aggregates because of how much anxiety the aggregates cause us in that way 
And so this teaching about, yeah, and you don't have to be clinging to the aggregates that hard in that way. So it's just such a powerful teaching in that sense. So yeah, Noe, please. This is great. Uh, my teacher said, no fear. No fear. You know, when you perform, you, you perform fearlessly. It's like, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And then it happens, but you just keep going forward. No fear. But who's having the fear? <laughs> now we go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. No, and it's a it's a, a big part of Buddhism, both the early teachings and much more so in the Mahayana, but a state of fearlessness is a big part of the practice. I mean, and not, I mean, yeah, like, you know, I don't want to say it's not this stoic fearlessness. It's actually understanding where fear is coming from. Noticing actually that all fear stems from self, whether it's fear of dying, fear of reputation, fear of survival. These are all things the Buddhists talk about. And those fears are all predicated on self in a very acute way especially the idea of like reputation in that sense. Think about the fear of public speaking and how much that has to do with self in that way. Cause you're nervous like about how are they going to perceive me and all of that. So noticing the, the tie and that relationship between fear and self is an important one, especially if you'd like to be fearless, because that's where you can begin untying those knots that are binding us to it that way so awesome all right everybody i think we should uh, probably call it a night then um so that's perfect that we got through those two and then that sets us up to move on to that section about samsara and then that'll get really interesting uh, next weekend so hope you can all join me and join us